been, been crazy. Some of the stories coming out of that really powerful stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you like, man, I've been following it quite a bit. This is like so, I never followed anything like this in my life. Uh, have you been looking a lot at it yourself or? <clears throat> I've been having BBC News on in the background while I've been doing some work, so I've, I've heard bits and pieces and seen some of the stories that have popped up on Instagram as well that people have shared. Yeah, it's really crazy. Man. I mean, the response is just so strong as well. It's it's not just a one way battle. I think as some people thought it would have been. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, should we get uh, right into it? Yeah. Let's. We're excited. Let's do it right. Awesome. Yeah. Is that if I record our discussion so I can yeah, definitely. draw quotes? So I'm, I'm going to record okay. that too, so, so uh, it's recording awesome. in video. Yep. Great. Perfect. All right. Sweet. We'll, we'll get right into it then if you're ready. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Perfect. So I first want to touch upon your past a little bit to mm -hmm. inform who you are today. Yeah. So can you tell me a little about your upbringing in Poland? Yeah, uh, I mean, this this was the time behind the Iron Curtain. I mean, the memories from all that long time ago is, I mean, uh, I mean, you got the playground, you, you got the communist blocks, the, you know, kind of the residential apartments like everyone lived in from doctors to scientists to janitors. And it was kind of like that. But um, the thing that stood out, though, was things like you have to wait in line for food, like like butter and meats and things like that. And I remember my mom, you know, I mean, you have to queue up. Uh, wait in long lines thing for things like butter. I remember one time I was uh, I was actually playing. Th they had this little bunny land for skiing because it was winter, and 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 my mom got pissed at me because uh, I was out there playing, and instead I was supposed to go to the store to help her get more butter and stuff like that. Uh, and then towards the end, I do remember. I mean, there were Russian tanks rolling down our streets next to the next to the. Uh, the residential complex this was towards the martial law time like uh, we left in 1982 so that's when like martial law just started all the uprisings with solidarity so I mean but everything was kind of gray it was kind of grayish it's not you know economically the country was not prosperous so that when I came to the United States it was just amazing to see all the variety in the stores. It's like, man, like a hundred varieties of everything, which the shelves were typically kind of empty. They have like bread and vinegar and basics. And, but yeah, it wasn't prosperous. We always look to the West for good stuff. But yeah, yeah. Um, and then I also remember like things like from my grandparents' side. So, so my grandfather was in a Polish underground during Second World War. He'd tell me some stories about like blowing up German supply trains. One of my grandmothers was in a concentration camp, so she she didn't talk much about it. But I mean, that's that's something that she, I mean, she survived, and but that's kind of I think that that affects uh, probably affected my father a bit, and uh, those on on his side. So those kind of stories that was that was kind of in our psyche there, because yeah, it wasn't wasn't um, I couldn't say as as a child. I mean, I wasn't politically socialized or anything like I, I didn't know anything about politics but because we left at right. 10 I was at uh, it was 10 that I left I was like fourth grade but yeah so I was kind of secluded from it not really seeing any of the political action or anything like that but uh, definitely the thing that stuck is like well how can one country be like this and you know like materially deprived versus another with let's say America where it's abundance like what makes a difference so that definitely made me think about things like that if I if I look back at that in retrospect yeah great well i want to talk moving forward a bit in time after <laughs> sorry i've got roosters in the background here oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> i like to, I like to talk about your experience in missouri in particular uh, you know after your time at university looking to the future what inspired your decision to start your own farm and what were the lessons you began to learn through that journey that you had yeah well uh, you have to start with that like at, at the grad school level though because uh Basically, when I was about 30 or so, I started to meditate. I, I did this lifestyle engineering thing where I learned to to meditate, breathing, Indian cooking, uh, yoga, and stuff like that. Uh, so I was kind of put on a different level. I was about my second year of grad school. And then when I was in my classes, which were highly theoretical, it's kind of like hazing in some way when you go through the grad school program because you got to take all these hard classes. And a lot of this stuff was so irrelevant and 
and using like old formalisms, highly theoretical, and stuff that didn't, you know, we were talking about stuff that didn't exist. And um, it was really alienating for me because uh, I switched into physics so I could, I started with chemistry undergrad and then physics in grad, and I was always looking to do good things with my, my skill set. But the farther I went, the, the more useless I, I was feeling. So a lot of the time during college when I was in all these theoretical seminars, it was like, man, um, just getting really alienated and really combined with my ability to meditate at that point, I, I was like, man, this is ridiculous. Like, what's going on here? How are we going to solve any problems? The one thing I noticed was that none of the disciplines talk to each other either. And how can you expect to have people produce viable solutions when they don't know how their discipline, you know, at the highest level relates to anything else. I still think that's like a really dangerous uh, aspect of how society operates. I and mean, of course there's specialization and that's, that's cool or gets certain advantages, but the way that we are getting so siloed and specialized um, really doesn't help society. And right now with the, um, that's what we're trying to work on. But, but the idea there was, so I said, oh man, definitely I'm not going to end up in some research or cubicle job. Because I mean, I'd be slated for like being a professor or research, researcher or somebody in a white collar job. I was like, no way. I mean, these people are not doing anything to, um, like in an integrated way that I thought was making an impact. I was in fusion energy and people were talking i mean it's a hard thing to do i mean it's the same energy that's on the sun and so we're trying to bring it down to earth and tame it basically turn i mean it's really taming taming nukes like high mm. like hydrogen bombs Th these are controlled hydrogen bombs so you might say that you know that that is a tough problem and um when i was just looking at those discussions in the field it was like i noticed that man we are so far away from that and as the more i looked into it and the issues of radioactivity or problems that can come with it, which they will. I mean, it's still, it's a completely unsolved issue, even in fusion. Um, I was like, what are we doing? Though? We have solutions right now, like renewable energy, like s solar cells. At that time, I mean, they were pretty expensive. Now they're like really dirt cheap. But I was like, why are we doing all these crazy things if we can, using existing technology, we can completely thrive? So with that kind of a notion, I said, hmm, well, let's try that. Like, why don't we try get a plot of land and see what we can do by tapping into all the beautiful existing technology. So I started reading all the books on permaculture, on renewable energy, on history, like the green history. Like, I was literally spending more time like on my independent study than, than I was in my, my program, for which I almost got kicked out a couple of times and failed my prelim examined the program once so I had really had to buckle down and focus uh, because I was alienated I didn't want to spend time on it I was like man this is there's this whole other world of of uh, progressive thought and I didn't think the centralized system was getting towards that so the first thing I said hey let's um, let's start experimenting as soon as, as soon as I get out of college get out of the PhD program finish that successfully and uh, got a plot of land and in Missouri. Before that, we did, did about a year of gardening around the area of Madison, Wisconsin. And then at that time, I was like, land. Well, if you have land, land is the source of all the wealth that we have. So what can you do with it? And combining modern technology with it, what can you actually do in terms of, like I said in my TED talk, to start a sustainable life or village and civilization? I mean, really at a big... Know, a, a lofty concept saying what are the limits like we can get anything from the earth including like aluminum and hydrogen for fuel we got solar energy plants rocks soil water i mean that's all all the wealth of the land comes from of, of civilization comes from that right like, like silicon from sand i mean the most advanced technologies there that's sand so yeah. the experiment really really went to okay well can we actually on any parcel of land that's got basic resources the natural resources i mentioned can, can we actually start up a real um modern civilization from that as an experiment and that's kind of kind of the theme back here but beyond that it's like if you can show that then you can show some major change in the way the world works like applied to right now for example countries being autonomous like 
Germany, who almost didn't want to support the Ukrainian conflict because of their gas and, you know, they needed gas from Russia and stuff like that. But they said, yeah. But right. these kinds of geopolitical things, if if countries are more more autonomous, a lot of those resource-based conflicts just go away. Like, by design, you get rid of certain aspects of centralization. Just like, you know, say Putin right now, it's you got gas and oil. Like, what if the world was uh, running on solar energy? I mean, where would Putin get his funding? So, so by virtue of the affordances of the kind of technology that we have, we can create, I believe we can create the reality that can be much better. And that starts with, um, well, with, with basic resources and using, on the one side, using what we already have in the world we know that we can survive and thrive using using technology that we have today abundantly, but you know we keep progressing and right. kind of, uh, technology not catching up to um, society not catching up to responsibility with this technology, uh, including like recent you know people are really scared about AI taking over with rogue robots and stuff like that, like technology running away. Um, that's the kind of thing we're trying to address, saying how can we uh, change that. Therefore, I said, yeah, let me just participate right, right in that. And then, so I, you know, I read all the books when I, while I was in college. I said, okay, I'm going to get to this piece of farmland. And then I found that, oh, man, the reality is much different. I was completely unprepared. That was what I found out. But, um, and that's the kind of thing. Like when you're in school, you think you know everything. And then you go, go into some reality like, oh, I got to grow some wheat here and there's weeds or the tractor broke down and, and I didn't right. <laughs> I didn't have any like literally when it came down to it the tools and skills that I needed <clears throat> the real like practical down to earth not like some theory that I learned and yeah. all the good stuff like it's it sounds great but when you try to implement it it's hard and I can also appreciate why people just want to destroy nature and just power over it because it's hard. It, you know, survival is in some way hard. But I think it's hard because we don't collaborate. So that brings up the issue of how do we start like not only developing sound technology but collaborating across the world. To, I mean, to a vision where I mean, just imagine a world where man, everyone's prosperous, has opportunity, and to do what they they want and need, and getting rid of all the conflicts that we have today. We can create a an amazing reality but and some people can say humanity is moving forward on that but there's a lot of a lot of gaps and that's what we're trying to address yeah but that's that's the moving like right onto the land just starting experiments starting to build things grow things and and land is was where it's at so i was like okay i gotta get land and uh, i got a loan from my brother and my partner we, we did that in in missouri yeah that, that is incredible. And I, I'm looking to transition as well. What inspired you from what you learned on the farm and those experiences that you had to actually create this nonprofit, Open Source Ecology, and the Global Village Mindset? Yeah, that so, yeah, so the transition was actually in the last year of the PhD. I, I kind of formulated this idea um, of a collaborative uh, paradigm for society because um, even in my research, I was not able to t talk openly to others, like to really share and to learn. And I was like, what's going on here? I mean, this is this is academia. This is where we're supposed to learn and share and do that. And, and still there was competition there, people vying for grants. So I noticed how in that setting, uh, there was very little collaboration. And sorry, you remind me the, the direction that I'm going? Uh, about starting open source ecology and the global village. Yeah, fundamentally, ecology refers to the integration of human natural ecosystems along the routes of open source principles, which are fundamentally based on collaboration. So seeing that lack of collaboration uh, in, even in my career in the, the brief career in the academia, uh, getting a PhD, I was like, man, we gotta fix that. So I just simply started asking the simple question what would it really look like if we truly collaborated can the result be different so how can we start an experiment how let's let's do it like i saw it was not happening it's just not happening like how can you um learn the best things like like just think about this when you're 
like any advanced product like if i wanted to design an engine or a rocket like in in school right. you don't learn any of that stuff you learn principles but the fact is the best technology in any area is completely proprietary in other words in school you might think oh i'm learning to you know be a rocket engineer or this or that but you don't actually learn anything then you go into the proprietary world and the companies have that information but only kind of like the droppings of the table come down to the university level because the the top info is just simply not open so seeing that i was like man there's such an opportunity here like what if we all collaborated to, to do this, how can our technology be better? Well, absolutely, it would be like, if you think about it for a second, like we could collaborate and then not solve, have a hundred people reinventing a wheel, saving the same problem, like, you know, like a hundred car companies vying for the market space, right? Or thousands right. of, uh, I mean, what if we had like one or a few really, 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 really top things in each area because we collaborate and then we can move on to other bigger problems like there are bigger problems than just making like the next model of the car the next model of the ford or whatever you know there's definitely issues like okay here's hunger here's poverty here's homelessness or pollution or you know global warming like man let's let's get beyond the the simple survival issues which where we're still at and start asking bigger questions so that was that was the that was the concept of open source ecology where the ecology refers to integration of human and natural ecosystems that work in harmony to, to collaboratively. And the natural ecosystems, that has to be in there because we, we can't forget that all the wealth comes from land. Uh, you know, right. And of course, started asking, initially I said, okay, well, what if we could even get like semiconductors and aluminum, like metals, like right from the dirt. It's like, that's a real question though, because those technologies do exist. And if technology is, is really getting better and smaller, you know, um, just more powerful together, we should be able to do this in our backyards or on a small scale or on like village scale to, to make every community just absolutely prosperous. So that, that was the idea and started, um, so just coined the concept of um, open source ecology. It was a, Ba way back in 2004 and then essentially so got onto the piece of land got my ass kicked by uh the reality which was yeah i, I really had no practical skills really like uh, i mean one assumption is that oh yeah well the technology exists therefore oh yeah i'll just buy it and i'll use it but it turned out not to be like that because things break and they're designed they're not designed for a lifetime they're designed to be so complicated and the user cannot fix them and when I saw that, I was like, man, okay, so the tractor broke. But what happened there was like, the tractor broke, I paid $2,000 to, to, for them to break the tractor apart, uh, to replace a part in the transmission. And it takes them like all day to crack the tractor in half where that part was to, to get to the part. I ended up paying $2,000 and two weeks later, thing breaks again. I was like, wow. oh, wait a minute. This is not right. First of all, yeah. I can't do it. It's expensive. It was, you know, weeks of a couple of weeks of downtime. This is ridiculous. What happened to our technology? It's like it's run amok. So I noticed that people think, oh yeah, we, we have technology. Oh yeah, you can buy a tractor. Well, not if it's you have you know nothing about it because it's proprietary and if you can't fix it, you know, just get parts and fix it or whatever, you completely do not own it. And that's the same kind of conflict that John Deere is having right now, where it's putting all, I don't know if you've heard about this, where the tractors, mm -hmm. uh, they have proprietary electronics and a, and a farmer cannot fix them. So they have to send them back to the repair. Like you, you're not actually not allowed to fix your own tractor. And, and that's, those actually, uh, you can read that in the news if you want a John Deere tract, proprietary tractors. And, uh, yeah, there were rebe there were people like really re rebelling against that farmers. A lot of farmers were getting pissed off that they can't even they don't really own their tractor, like they cannot mess with it or the warranty is voided, and stuff like that. So it's called the right to repair. But that issue is there. Like okay, that's in the mainstream world um, with regular farmers seeing that. But um, that direct experience of that tractor breaking really just made me think. It's like man, this is ridiculous. And if I'm gonna solve this for myself, I might as well solve it for everybody open source right. blueprints 
why reinvent the wheel? So once again, going with the ideas of why are we not colla truly collaborating? Why is this already not available? So yeah, that was just some, so it's a breakthrough kind of in my mindset was like, man, this is, that's amazing. It's such an opportunity and pursued exactly that. And, you know, culminating in a TED talk at that time, showing to the world that, wow, this industrial productivity or the ability to, to do things, build things, design things and open them and people actually replicating them, that's feasible. Um, disc uh, discover for myself that this amazing level of productivity is feasible on a small scale and there's just a whole untapped world of distributed collaborative production that's still not happening I mean, that's nobody's doing that there's like not a single product that is being developed in a collaborative way there's some fringe examples but yeah. by and large I mean nobody's heard of that it's like you you talk about that and say okay where's your patent like if you try to do this and try to get money for it people will be like okay where's your patents and um proprietary information to make it feasible because people are assuming that oh you have to be proprietary be if you do any hardware because that's how history has been for a long time so noticing that right. we're moving full ahead on uh, the global village construction set and that was the start of it, the, the 50 different machines to make a small civilization with modern comforts. And that's still to be developed, to be finished. We're like 30% through that process and much more than that. So maybe I'll stop and does that answer the question of, of the, the birth of open source ecology? Yeah, it does. I also want to touch upon, you know, when you had that breakthrough, what, what did that success look like given the example of the tractor? So what were you able to achieve? You know, you said that it broke and you had to pay $2,000 to fix it and it broke again. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the final result like when you fully addressed that problem? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll start with, so that was the tractor, but even before yeah. that, so when we moved out here, it was a blank piece of land. It was a big soybean field. That's it. N now we've got buildings and workshops and a little bit of infrastructure. But that time it was completely bare. Ended up building a, an earth bag hut, like a small thing for myself and my partner. It was back breaking work. So when I saw that, I was like, okay, well, let's use some technology here. And, and that's when we built the first brick press, the compressed earth block press, which makes blocks from dirt that you uh, it's compressed earth and use it you use it as a structural building material um so that was a, the first success and we built the first workshop with that uh so we started building with that um but initially so 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 the success looked like okay so yeah let's think about it can i build it at that time i haven't built anything i didn't have really much practical experience i picked up a welder and torch and just taught myself to do that but I mean I didn't learn that in in grad school or anything they don't like in grad school you don't do any hardly any uh, build work some someone else does it for you if you because you're kind of the once again the, the split between the all the disciplines like you're not in a workshop actually producing parts or building your experiments you actually have people the, the, the workshop guys do that for you so I mean I had no experience literally uh, right. I was like very very minor things I did on my own but uh, so I picked up a welder and, and torch and started to build this this brick press with hydraulics and which was automated. And at that time, I was like, "Man, is that possible?" It was it was like nobody's done that kind of stuff really. Um, you know, maybe there's some someone here and there. But I said, "Hey, this you know, let's strip it down to the basic concepts, and maybe I could build something that that would otherwise cost me twenty five thousand dollars." So, so I did for like $3,000, built the first brick press. It was like, wow, we were expecting like maybe three bricks per minute. And we ended up getting like 10, you know? So it's like, holy cow, technology actually works. And it's amazing. <laughs> and it's always been that way that, holy cow, this, this amazing technology is all there, but we just don't have access to it because we've been um, kind of specialized away from seeing that power. But then I saw that in my own hands and I was like, holy cow if i can right. learn this i mean we can teach this we can change the world with this kind of aspect to just ma unleash massive amounts of potential around the world right 
So that was the first yeah, success. Uh, with the brick yeah. press, actually, it worked better than I thought. It was like, wow. Mm -hmm. The tractor That's came. Fantastic. Yeah, tractor came. I mean, a tractor is much more complicated. That's like a now a moving machine. You got to steer it. You got right. you know the loader and things like that. So that was the second thing, and, and I started on it. And and with a physics mind, kind of looking at first principles. First principles, you take the problem and strip it down to its basic parts and kind of uh, derive a solution. So so I thought about that. Okay, what's a tractor? Well, what do you need for that? Well, you need a frame, you need drive, you need an engine. So, you know, broke it down into basic concepts. And at the end of the day, it's like, well, it's really like a, this steel box with wheels. And now right. you have hydraulics, like these amazing, this amazing technology where you can actually direct couple these big hydraulic motors to the wheels, and there you go. And we designed it, started to design things in a modular way, such that, for example, you can take off the power unit, we call it the power cube, uh, you can put it on another machine or another, tr another tractor. Like we started designing it very modularly. So simplified the design, made it modular, and as easy as possible. So it has the basic functionality, and then you can go from there. So when I saw that, that was that was pretty cool. Like, okay, so the thing worked. I mean, there's of course you can make many, many improvements, but we used it and still you know, use our now the live track from 2016 right now, and we've got to still make the next iterations. We've got the micro tractor and things like that. We use it in the construction, um, but yeah, uh, like, to have that feel like with a micro track right now, I'm out there. It's like, okay, here's this open source house that we designed. I'm using this right. open source machine that, that as a part of that process, that's collaboratively developed. If anything breaks, I go down to the shop and get some basic parts and, and fix it right there. Like, so downtime is anytime, like an hour or two. So yeah, it, it feels great. That that's um, I mean you can't really explain it until you you see that you're proud of yourself for for building something substantial. And I think with the with the physical technologies, that's especially empowering because you can see it right there. It is so right. real. Yeah. I also want to touch upon uh, what, what type of support have you seen? You know, what kind of people have, have gotten on board with this, and what have their reactions been? Yeah, I mean. Um, <laughs> All kinds of people, all walks of life people. And there's been a, a number of replications of things like the brick press, uh, even the tractor a couple of times. Uh, people who are, tip the profile is typically someone who's um, who wants to use the equipment themselves, kind of the, the builder, the kind of worker person. Um, now, the problem is that, and that kind of gets into the idea of, um, getting the, the things to the product level because because a collaboration it's awesome we, we discover that people from all over the world would, would show up to to prototype machines during dedicated project visit people would actually come to our site they, they heard about it and saw it on the internet because i would of course blog and put up a right. lot of videos on this uh, so we had a person from the uk who was a welder who came we were working on the early tractors all kinds of people from um different countries uh, at any time, we had a few people around, um, like by 2011 or 2010 or so, we had like 10 people who just saw this stuff on the internet. We were all building stuff in the workshop. We were uh, doing a production run of four tractors and four brick presses, which we sold, um, things like that. Uh, now, the thing is, though, you really have to, there's one, you can have the, the early prototypes, the, the actual beta versions, but... yeah. Outside of the house, which we were like totally taken to the finish line as an enterprise, we haven't focused mm -hmm. on finishing that. So, and at any time, like yeah, the eighty percent machine or the ninety percent or even ninety nine percent machine, there's there's like this lot a lot of work to, to get it to a hundred percent, and and then you have to continue developing it because you might need to keep up with developments and improvements all the time. So, um, the thing is. Uh, regarding the kind of people like nobody has done it for a full-time job to this point like outside of our, ourselves here myself and my partner so that's that's an issue there's a there's a guy in uh, 
in Botswana actually who's starting like OSC Botswana trying to get a facility up there uh, that's like the closest I've seen to somebody saying okay we're gonna I'm gonna actually do this for a full full-time job but the thing that's needed is the continuous development and in a volunteer project that's the issue there it's like there's a lot of computer programmers lots of people socially minded um, a lot of people don't just don't have this skill set, so they can contribute in one thing. But but we're integrating so many things that the the big link, big missing link is the integrated s skill sets necessary to develop this. So it's so we're trying to push push out the CDCO home right now as a completely finished product. But the thing is, uh, right. one thing I noticed is that the kind of person I mean, people have jobs, people like yeah. completely relied on volunteer people all the time, and we're we're seeing the limits of that because. To do something to the very very end, man, it's like to get from that eighty percent to a hundred percent. It's like ten times more work, uh, especially if you want to develop the enterprise level. That's that's even more. So there's a huge amount of work, and we're trying to address that point right now. Um, we haven't been able to convince any foundations or anything to, to really support it in a, in a like a dedicated way. I mean, we did get some foundation funding, like probably close to like a million of it, but. Um, but it just runs out and then you gotta like kind of start from scratch what do you do then you know we hired people before too but uh so we did have some people that we actually paid but we never got to that finish line because now i really appreciate how much effort it takes and to get there yeah yeah i want to talk about what osc looks like today you know how, how is this community collaborating together i mean how does someone in botswana become involved uh, is it all through internet resources you know what does the nonprofit look like as of right now yeah so we, we typically ran summer programs and immersion training programs so last year we ran the most most ambitious one uh, w where we had called the summer summer of extreme design build but typically it's our core core people which is just two of us on site and then summer programs and workshops and of course the global community and inter interacting on the internet through the wiki and Google Docs and design sprints and other things now the the direction we're going into right now is is the long-term immersion training where you get out of this and you can do this for a living so that is right. that missing missing link last year we started our first six-month apprenticeship uh, to start building the CD go homes with marginal success I mean we noticed that in six months um, it wasn't really enough time for people to start from zero to, to actual high competency. And then of course, there's the recognition that this work is hard. Like we're focusing now on the CD go home, but yeah. the construction work, man, that is hard. So a lot of the idealists who, um, who come into this, you also have to have, be really able to have the grit and the hard work to make it, right. to make it happen. But that's, that's the direction right now. It's like, I'm saying to myself, well, yeah, we can do these um, these workshops, but the energy has to go to the point where there's people doing this for a living. So, right. based, and, that, and then taking on the leadership of this as a as a distributed project in various countries. So right now, we're shifting. So we're trying to release the CD go home, and with that an immersion program that on one side gets you just to building the homes, but then more ambitiously, more like four year. Right now, I'm, we're formulating the, what it would look like to do the four year, the six year, and like more like eight year even. But like four and six year, like four year is like a whole college education, where after that, right. yes, absolutely, you can do one of these things. In fact, your project is gonna be, okay, take this tractor, take it to completion, or take one of the tools and take it to completion and do that for a living as an integrated program where you learn to design, you learn to build, and you learn to enterprise with it. So we're thinking that like the six year master's level where, so the four year would be where you actually learn to design and build it, so and design and build, so develop it fully. In the next two years, create an open source business around it. That's a whole bunch of other skill sets related to enterprise and leadership and open collaboration, a huge realm of open collaborative techniques. Like how do you do all this stuff with a bunch of people around the world? Uh, there's a big right. skill set required to do that. And then more like for the eight year, like the PhD level would be, how do you 
organize and actually think about, okay, there's a big problem, collaboratively, we're gonna solve it. So take a look at issues like, how do I contribute significantly to solving housing in a significant right. way? Or how do I contribute to world peace or disarmament or sound uh, like military policy or whatever? Um, how do I solve hunger? So take, taking on projects, theoretically, but then your your research, it's action research. It's like you're actually getting in there and probably, not probably, but pretty much, you gotta start up some enterprise, uh, whatever that means, but enterprise. This is your endeavor that supports you. You're getting right. paid by it and you're solving that problem at the same time. So, so a place that completely revisits like the purpose and meaning of what it means to get into ed- to get an education it's not just like for some random thing so you can work in a cubicle this is no you you're getting trained and you're agreeing to hey after this i am first of all i'm interested in solving taking on a big big issue and collaboratively solving it so that's that's the kind of framework we're we're looking at right now so and that's um that means building a campus here right now it's it's marginal we've got a few buildings and a workshop but yeah we're, we're building up to that right now Got it. Awesome. I wanted to talk about the seed of eco homes as well. Yeah. Because uh, I'm really curious about not only the, the inspiration behind them, but the, the work and cooperation that went into building these, you know, mm-hmm. and how it's been applied, the impact that it has had, and the impact that it could have in the future. Yeah. And I also need to move like, in my computer real quick because it will die. <laughs> okay. There we go. <laughs> all right. We're all set. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for the CD home, actually we have to trace the, ba- the the work back all the way to probably like 20, around 2012 where we built the first, micro, it was called a micro house. So basically a small structure made of compressed earth blocks. We did that, we did micro house one and show that, oh yeah, we can build with our brick press, awesome. Micro house two, three, four. And then after that, uh, kind of transition that to the CD eco home, we actually stopped more of the brick press and recognizing how difficult that is because that's that's more difficult using construction lumber is much easier so we actually migrated that to this house which is the cd go home one which was built collaboratively in a sense that for all these builds we would get people online to design this and not not huge teams a few people uh collaborating on the the design and blueprints it was unfortunately like the reality was it's kind of a heroic effort and getting some volunteers on the side because it's 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 a lot of work but then during the builds the cool thing was we would swarm on it we had like 12 or 24 people the first build was like 12 people micro house 2 was like more like 24 people that's the kind of numbers we had after that 24 and then up to like 48 for this house but the cool thing was that people can participate as an immersion experience actually implementing this open source design, meaning we're actually getting people from all over the world to show up to build this stuff as a replicable model. So when we built this house, we actually had people from like China, Belize, uh, Israel, like like six countries wow. came all over the world. People just came and we were building building this house together. So, so we address the, the prototyping side that way the actual design side, yeah, we, we did what we could, but typically with a small core team. For this, the CD Go Home 2, uh, we were designing that in last year's uh, immersion program. So we actually got a whole bunch of people, uh, about a dozen or so, working on it in tandem, like using open source software, uh, sharing uh, basically global, global, some global, largely local collaboration on designing the, all the modules because we're doing modular design so that we're breaking the house into typically like four by eight <coughs> build modules, like all the wall modules, windows, doors, and other things. So we're able to leverage a modular design process with people on the internet and then in real life swarming to these builds. Because we're designing for a method that can be built very rapidly with a, with a yeah. A lot of people uh, without as much skill as, as typically required. Uh, but that's that's kind of how it looks. Does that address it? Because um, yeah. it does not address the um, actual what are the, the hopes for this, but the hopes are we get to the best design, to the quickest design to build, so that anyone can build this at the minimal cost. So think about here's the best house you can get. It's modular, so you can 
you know, take down, download the, the files, you can modify them, you know, all in open source software like FreeCAD or Sweet Home 3D, and then build them yourself. We train people to build them, we train entrepreneurs to build them, and we use that as a model, a business model that we develop for ourselves to really scale the operation because everyone needs a house. So we think we can have a huge market for this, and our simple goal is solve housing. I mean, what does it mean for everybody to have access to a home? On one side is the build aspect, but then we have to figure out other issues like how do you get land in different places, or how do you get through right. building codes and things like that. So we're documenting all of that as well. And I think for as, our, as far as our goals, when you see those 40 acre cookie cutter developments, well, we want to yeah. do that with sustainable ecological housing that's off-grid and stuff like that, renewable energy. So we want to do that kind of stuff, show that this model can completely, not only compete, but exceed the expectations of a kind of a build model. Because right now it takes like seven to 12 months to build a house. We can do this if everything's lined up with 24 people in five days. So wow. It's crazy. So if you think about that kind of efficiency and the design that people contribute to in all aspects, from the designs to interior decorating, further models developed collaboratively, you can, you can envision a process where all the best minds, and not even the best minds, people who have knowledge about various aspects of the process contributing to it, and therefore making the best, simply the best product. Like, like I mentioned, there's like no best products because everyone's competing. Uh, so, so that's our goal. If we can make the best thing, then this can spread around the world and address housing by uh, all the aspects that are required. And I don't know what it all will be, but we're, we know that by open collaboration, we'll have enough eyes and enough collaboration input on it that it always is improving and it's always, always growing. And, and that really needs to be clearly visible to, to people because... Um, uh, people haven't heard, a lot of people haven't heard of open source, but if we can show this as a housing model, then everyone needs a house, right? So we can right. introduce that as your Trojan horse to say, well, okay, this house is, uh, yeah, it's a real house and you can get it for low cost uh, as affordable housing, but it's also open source. It's collaboratively developed. You can actually get a, start a business around it. We can teach you how to build the tractors that build a house and everything else. We can teach you how to design. Um, so we're trying to create a whole ecosystem around that so that uh, that's now for housing. And if we can do that with housing, why not do this with all the other elements? And the next element we're looking at is renewable energy. Like how about solar hydrogen economies to get all right. the oil and, and gas economy, the, the fossil fuels. I mean, that's completely feasible, but because of the inertia and the centralized system, we're, we're just saying, hey, we can completely do this even with today's technology, because yeah, like prices of solar photovoltaics have dropped so much, and we need yeah. everybody, everybody's mind to get around the next big problem, which we're probably gonna take on energy, which will feed back into this house, because on one side you have uh, solar panels, and then the second part is now you're starting to make your own hydrogen as a fuel for your cars, for your energy in the house, and stuff like that. So we envision that this transitions easily to, to a hydrogen economy infrastructure where now, okay, now we've erased the fuel and fossil fuel issue. Now you're actually turning this house into a productive thing. So we envision converting the infrastructures of civilization to more productive, more integrated with the environment, less, uh, like, like housing should not be a, like a blight on a, on a landscape, it should be something that adds to it and provides things like energy or food with the aquaponic greenhouse addition that we can do. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious as well, I'm, I'm glad you touched on it, on it briefly uh, about the land, you know, because how does, I live in the Los Angeles metropolitan area, you know, there's a lot of land open there, how would an urban person become involved in this process who doesn't necessarily have the resources to buy, lease, or even access land in the first place? Yeah, I mean, at that point you can contribute to the design, but the real thing is like, if you're the, if you're actually going to build one of these, that's, that'll be the, the most uh, enticing thing for somebody to get involved with. In the meantime, it's, um, I mean, supporting the effort in, in various ways so that 
you know, we can go out there and build for you. Or if you're more entrepreneurial, we do, we are offering these two week crash courses uh, where we believe that someone who really wants to build their house, yeah, they can learn all this in, in about a two week period. But then again, you have to get access to land, like in where you are, yeah, it's gonna be crazy. But the facts are the planet, if you look at the global numbers, 3% yeah. of the world's surface is cities. So um, what that means is that if uh, people can reorganize, they, you know, you can think about taking a few of your friends and creating a community somewhere on a larger plot of land. As long as you have the UPS truck and the internet, you can probably <laughs> work effectively. Um, right. But yeah, it is, I mean, the land part is an issue, but at the same time, it's like, if you know how to build so you you effectively become a, an open source developer like a developer in the sense of developing land uh, which we can teach then much more of that can happen in a more cost-effective way or more uh, more public interest way that new opportunities arise whereas like an investor might need oh like they might need the best location or or just everything for the economics to work out if if we can reduce the cost on that and enable more people to do that, the supply goes up, opportunities for where you can do that will go up. Because you're not constrained just to the limits of, I'm not sure if it makes sense, but just to the limits of, of how, um, you know, like high economic feasibility yeah. has to make it happen. But that's, but it's it may be economically unfeasible because the cost is high, and why is it high? Well, because you have all the design costs and, and expensive build costs and you know, you're hiring all these people. We're trying to streamline the whole process so it's simply less expensive. And if it's less right. expensive, that means it could be more democratic. Not just uh, expensive developers and people, investors, you know, top investors get the ability to decide what gets built where more people can get involved in it. So it's always about democratization and just lowering the barrier to entry to that. So say you got like, a, you know, some lot, like, I mean, just to give you an example, in Kansas City, there's tons yeah. of land, like lots, empty lots in a city. And it's like, why is nobody building there? Mm. Well, on one side, you might have like less favorable sections of town, but there's, there's plenty of places where you do have good land and good section but a, a, a normal developer isn't going to touch it they did typically don't want to touch like single lots because okay. it's much more profitable to do like a whole development so right. that's an example where okay now we have the open source techniques the lower costs and agents like myself who are just going to go there, hey let me snap up this plot and this lot of land mm -hmm. and build there and build something that's more affordable too so you're you're influencing affordability but like whereas if if i were waiting for a developer it's like okay there's all this land there's a sh housing shortage hey what's going on there's yeah. like there's plenty of land there's plenty of these lots it's just that it's not possible in the current system to execute on that so we're trying to lower the barriers to make it completely feasible in more locations yeah right and, and looking talking not just about you know, the economic or the physical barriers uh, of getting, you know, land, like the example of the house. I'm curious as well, what are the barriers that you see for an open source culture? You know, like culturally, getting everyone on board, uh, oh, yeah. what are the barriers you see that could block that development? Yeah, that's a big question. That's because uh, for the last 200 years, people have been learning that, oh yeah, everything is proprietary. There's 200 years of industrial history where everything is proprietary and that's up to today so the biggest cultural block is shifting from a mindset of scarcity to abundance that's like oh yeah obvious but there's so much pressure everywhere to compete to be better um, and part of that is uh, when you're competing you're forced to like not share because if you if you're a competing person you get an advantage by not sharing so, right. and that's, that's obvious today if you start looking at it, it's like, okay, and uh, in the world of technology, you have to have patents to make something new, um, but there's so much influence from the current system that, that 
makes it, says that oh you have to be proprietary you have to compete uh, so that kind of collaborative culture is sadly missing and we call that collaborative literacy the recognition it's ultimately about an internal shift in people where so, so the way it works is that technology has been exploding so much because of human ingenuity but our minds take longer to adapt we're still like in this uh, fight or flight survival mode for the most part I mean it doesn't seem that way though events like Russia right now kind of show that plainly that we're in this scarcity complete scarcity mindset like there is no uh, not enough resources that's embedded in our politics parties competing against right. each other but I mean think about it there's so, 10,000 times more power that comes from the Sun that we than we use today so there's plenty of energy wow. I just mentioned that only 3% of the world's land mass is cities so there's, there's plenty of land there's plenty of resources but it's our ability to share and collaborate if we click off that competitive scarcity thing in our mind which is well built in and that's like from the caveman times where you know people would be killing themselves over resources that was very like up to the second world war and it's i mean it's decreasing but you know you can see plenty of conflict around still so it's this human cultural shift um right that's really an internal one so when we look at our program, I mean, the, the recognition for me this year has been that I'm not going to start with technology. I'm actually going to start with psychology. Right. And that is to teach you about peak performance and about human growth, possibility, opportunity to teach people out of their scarcity mindset. They have been taught from kindergarten. Uh, Steve was actually saying the other day, it's like from kindergarten, we're already like competing like uh, in various ways. Uh, I thought it only kind of started like after you get out of college, but no, I mean, everywhere, everywhere, you kind of have too much of it. And so we have to start by teaching people, and I believe it can be completely taught. I mean, I am so optimistic about the world, like whatever's happening in Russia, you know, with Putin or whatever. I mean, there's a very simple solution. It's to upgrade people, upgrades people's mindsets to those of abundance. That's a question of education. So, right. so you get that, the ability to think critically, i.e. to perceive reality, like mental models, media bias, fi fact check whatever it is so if you're in journalism you yeah. probably think about correct perception of reality right yeah. but, but we're not even taught any of that like in school like how do we what do we learn about mental models how right. we learn things and how we think critically so you have to start with teaching people how to think how to overcome their scarcity mindset how to design things and at that point you're kind of ready to start open collaboration but we're finding just huge uh, missing link on it. That's why, like, part of the reason why I don't think we have scaled, um, it's very hard to convince somebody that you can get a whole bunch of people together and actually develop something collaboratively that's better than anything else. It did happen with software. You know, so there's a great precedent. I mean, people are doing that in software. Um, and it hasn't transitioned yet to hardware. There's a, some kind of a block that... Uh, people can't recognize the, the concept that the non-scarcity, like the non-scarce resources, I don't know if you have uh, non-rival goods, the concept of non-rival goods, like software is non-rival. Like if I have a piece of software, if I give it to you by copying it, I don't lose anything, right? Uh, so people are pretty clear about that, non-rival resources. But the facts are, we can convert the physical reality in many, many ways into non-rival resources as well. Starting with the first principles, which say that we have way more energy from the sun than we use today, that we have also that we have plenty of resources and we can always use them more wisely or more effectively. So we need to get that kind of a new mindset into people's people's heads because 
it's just, just like for us, like, you know, when I had the TED Talk and there was tons of people just flooded my inbox with interest and so yep. forth. And I kind of felt that I missed it because we didn't really have the infrastructure to handle it. Um, right. I was like, oh man, too bad. And then, then a few years after that, I was like, um, going further and further into it, I noticed that, you know, whenever I did engage, we did put in various infrastructure, it was still super hard for anybody to collaborate and stay. I was like, huh, why can't, what's, what's going on here? How come people, you know, we've inspired, I've inspired people with the world, world's, uh, you know, on the world stage there with the TED Talk, and it was amazing. Right. And people were getting excited by the idea, but then nobody would stick around. And I thought about right. it, I was like, huh, um, maybe uh, there's something missing. I do definitely think that a collaborative mindset where you can actually envision that future and then work on it in a coherent way to get to the products and literally to creating a, a different kind of economy, that is a way too big a picture for most people to handle. So in retrospect, right. I actually see that, okay, well, all those people from around the TED Talk time, yeah, that's great. But we got to start from scratch in terms of educating people. Because if those people did come on, first thing they, they have to get into is the kind of a learning, a, a long learning process. That's why I said like our next step is to develop those learning mechanisms so that we can absorb people and they can change their mind while they're, cha while they're building things. They're actually doing right. things because you have to integrate. There's the visions, but then there's the reality that you have to completely integrate and then your inner self which you have to upgrade yourself in order to see this possibility of collaboration and abundance for everybody so it's not some kind of a hippie ideal it's a very rigorous process of lifting up your skill set to recognize the possibility so for us we think about our, our role as inspiring people to the possible to the possibility that's education uh, but creating the opportunities that's why the part of this is we develop the real business models and infrastructures where that can happen so people can see, hey, this is completely doable and we can have pros prosperity for everybody. But it's a, it's a big deal. Um, the blocks are, it's not technology, I can tell you. I used to think it was technology before I built the first brick press, which would work better than I thought. I found it's not technology. We have no problem producing or designing things. It's really now transitioning people's mindsets to a new possibility. People can't imagine that this is even possible because they have not done it. And they got so specialized, they cannot see the, the much more of the full package that's possible. Yeah. Right. And how do you educate people on this? You know, what are the resources that people can go to to learn more about this, this collaboration? And you know, starting even from kindergarten, how, how do we make this available for people and accessible? Well, I mean, on our website, like um, a lot of the wiki writings are starting with the TED Talk. There's a crash course on OSC, but we're finding that you know it takes a lot of skill set to, to actually do this. So yeah. what we're creating is the education programs. So that is great. We're gonna start at the level of here's the training that literally from the time probably from high school afterwards, or kind of like high school and equivalent. Start the programs that, that I mentioned, like the two year immersion. Um, yeah. four year and six year so developing those programs I think is has to happen because yeah we can publish a bunch of stuff and we do we publish a bunch of webinars you know start start by going to you know listen to all our videos and look at the wiki which I mean, it's not well organized and stuff like that but if you're really interested you can really delve into it and start parsing it I mean there's some people that like ate up the whole wiki and are pretty well versed in it but just only a few it's, otherwise it's a bunch of bunch of barriers to entry but for that reason we have to start with training the people who are going to do this and then those people will create more resources create training courses and everything else so that's our role to really educate people as we're doing the business side too which we think is inseparable from this so great that's where we're at nice. I'd like to mention, the, I mean, the last two years of the pandemic have been have been so difficult as well. You know, the mm -hmm. people who have suffered the most have been small businesses, while many big manufacturers and, and shipping companies have profited. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, how has your strategy shifted over the last two years, and how have you seen people's needs change? Yeah, it's shifted a lot. So, it's, so with Steve, we were, no, Steve was in the time, but we were 
at that time, about before the pandemic, we were heavy on doing STEAM camps, so basically technical education, um, doing a lot of workshops, potentially getting into schools and everything else. But we thought, hmm, that's great, but we need people getting jobs like right now and meeting real needs. So we switched to the house simply because it's such a much more tangible product. And the inertia, like the inertia or, or like the momentum for collaborative development of products, we, we actually started uh, before the pandemic, we were talking a lot about an incentive challenge to design a world-class cordless drill that's open source and can be 3D printed and stuff like that. It's like awesome, cool. Um, but we actually shifted. On the one side, we know that we do know that it's, there's definitely challenges to, to doing an open source product development process. We do still think that the incentive challenge, which is a funded, like, okay, collaborate to get this thing working uh, as a contest, which you get money for as a reward, uh, that still can work. But we said, no, let's just shift to the housing because it's so much more tangible and everybody wants a house. Whereas for the cordless drill, we were really like comparing like the STEAM education. Well, there's only so many people that know about 3D printers and uh, Arduinos and you know, small right. open source projects. Uh, so we said, let's, because part of that is getting the cultural shift. And for that, we need bodies and we need buy-in. And we thought the housing would be, when we thought about what could really make a difference, is definitely housing. And I still think that it's, it's the number one cost in anybody's life. So we're still going at that. Um, and rethinking how, like especially during the like the, the political polarization that has happened, like how do we yeah. continue to be open to everybody? Like I struggle with the question, like how do we get people of all classes and back backgrounds into the project? Well, we have to do it at all levels. We always have to try to push the boundaries of including um, just plain people who just want to work <clears throat> with their hands. But our solution for that is we're going to say that person, like say there's a normal person who sees, oh, I'm just going to be a truck driver or a heavy equipment operator or whatever, this or that. We're saying, no, no, no. You come into this, you can start with that, but there's always a growth track. So we're going to be very much centric. Like when we do this technical school for for the the housing, well, first you're going to be building. That's a building. That's a hard, hard job. But with that, we're encouraging you, you can set your own pay, you can do whatever you want. We're not setting any barriers. We want thousands of people around the world to be entrepreneurs who run their companies, who even run education centers. So, so expand your mindset to say, okay, you're not just signing up for uh, building a house. You're signing up for a lifelong journey of learning if you want it. And I'm telling you that you can and should do that because that's the way we kind of even integrate the, the class struggle. It's like, we want to have not, not have people all their life just work some grunt job. We want to uplift everybody. So we got to shift the thinking like on a corporate level too, to saying, okay, no, you're not going to have like your warehouse employees your whole life, whatever. It's like, there's always an opportunity to grow. And that's especially doable in a decentralized system where you're not talking about some big hierarchy of a big CEO of this entire company. No, like we're going to teach everybody to distribute this kind of business so they can truly get empowered. So that's how we, that, and COVID did that on my side. I'm, I'm really thinking heavily about how do we give people the opportunity to, to start to notice that, hey, wait a minute, I have this infinite possibility. Just like myself, going back to Poland, like, man, I can tell you, I, like when, when I first when I first came to America, I remember asking my father, like, so we were looking at some office buildings, we were in some park, some office buildings looking over the city. It's like, I was like, who owns those buildings? And, and it's like some companies. And it's like, I was like, well, doesn't the government own these? Because I was coming from Poland thinking that, oh yeah, the government owns everything. There's no private enterprise. So I was a complete slave in that sense. Like, I didn't know that you can actually do something with your life. You know, I knew you could be a scientist because my father's a scientist. But um, uh, I didn't know anything about the entrepreneurial way. And in that same sense, I know that one can transition from complete, like, oh, yeah, I can't change the world around me to completely, oh, yeah, you're a complete agent and you can do whatever you want. So we want to maintain that. And now with this conflict, man, the, the Russian, the Ukraine war, we also have to address, like, in the way we, it reinforces our 
mission of how important it is to do to create a distributed economy where countries like like for example like Germany or China or Russia which fuels Ger the whole Europe with fuels it's like man like why are we still in these huge centralized economy dependencies because right. like if we wanted to if the earth wanted to we can shift to hydrogen like tomorrow like I can make a long case for that I mean I study this kind of stuff the energy issues like at, the, at length and you're not going to hear somebody from the mainstream system propose that uh, right. because it's it's like too much against the status quo uh, so you need always the independent thinkers that can come from the, someone from the outside and make that kind of change but right now it's like OSC's role will be to create those leaders that can now say okay en masse we're going to solve housing we're going to solve energy so we can solve the trade issues solve the thing of like the complete dependence of, of the US on China, Chinese goods uh, right. It's like opium. There's this one guy, I forget what his name is, um, but he's called the modern day Soli, Solinitsyn, if you know that name. It's he, that guy wrote the, the Gulag Archipelago, some human rights activist. But there's a guy in, in China right now who's an active, he's exiled, but he said, Look, look, West, we got to get off the Chinese opium, and that is that trade, the complete dependence. Um, we got to stop smoking that stuff. It's true because we're, I'm complete, and I get all my parts from China. That's ridiculous. We have complete technology, and we can do that here, and we should. And that would address, when you think about the class issues, uplift everybody here, get higher tech, flexible uh, production happening here. Uh, not shipping it all off to, to other countries. Like those kinds of things we can do as geopolitical strategies. Like if we really want security, we should enable productivity everywhere so that people are, um, can produce what they need uh, very close to their homes. But right. uh, those some of the shifts like, that are continuing from the COVID and now from the war, like I'm just like using all this input from all these world, world things happening to, to influence where we're going because we can, we can really, in this kind of a, a life of uh, being an open source collaborator, you can say, oh yeah, well let's take that problem, let's get more people on that problem, let's just solve it. I mean, the solutions are there, it's just our will that prevents us from getting there. Yeah. Exactly, I hear you 100%. And, and we've just been, we've been talking for just over an hour now, so I wanna be mindful of your time. I have a few more questions if you have time for them. Let's we do continue? It. Yeah, yeah, okay. let's continue. I want to ask, uh, you know, we've talked about what kind of support that you're getting from people, but I also want to talk about the kind of support that you'd like to get from institutions. And mm -hmm. uh, what kind of support would you like to get from uh, the, the political, the policymaking realm, the corporate realm? You know, where do you see yourself moving into those spaces? Yeah, uh, I see ourselves as getting uh, power, power through economic power of doing good. And that is through deploying the the CE go home and having cohorts of people that we have trained. If we can show that we're in the phase, we're now producing houses, we're training a bunch of people, we're starting to get economic traction, that's when we can say, okay, people, we're ready. So in the business community, collaborations or possibly funding or whatever, but, but I see it as more, we're still a nonprofit, so we can get things like corporate donations or, or people collaborating, but basically we have to build up the infrastructure in-house so that when we make those asks, we can absorb it because we have the capacity. Like here's a collaborative infrastructure, or here's our next cohort of students that we want scholarships for, things like that. Um, it would also be at the point where we stabilize to, to uh, so basically I can step back more into the executive role, like right now we're just on the ground building the house and developing that program, but right. in terms of the real collaboration, it would mean putting out a few of those proposals, like here's a proposal for global collaboration on hydrogen, you know, here's a proposal like more of the, the white paper, the kind of a call to action of how we can envision a whole collaboration ecology of enterprises and institutions to contribute to these in a very 
low cost, effective way. That I would see largely as training people. So here's the campus we're building, fund this thing, gives us millions. Like for example, say the military, if they talk about peace or reconstruction, well, the real key to peace is productivity and open collaboration. So we can engage people across all walks of life to that and collaborate with them. But if we just went into, you know, the kind of like what we do right now is like banging head, heads against our walls, like same yeah. with steam camps and schools. Schools got already got their own agenda. They they kind of put people into cubicles. So there's limits to that. You can see us. So we have to grow as an entity where people are then going to listen to us. They're going to see, okay, you guys are actually getting economic traction. You're training people. You're building infrastructure. And at that point, we can say, you can do that too. So we'll be more like right. company, open source your cars and start collaborating with Toyota, Honda, and Ford and everybody. Make the best car. That's yeah. the kind of collaboration. We, we, I cannot just go to them and ask for handouts. I'm gonna, I want to come to them later on and say, collaborate, open up collaboration, uh, and here's ways you can do it because we're doing it and we're getting major economic traction. So we have to show that by example that this thing is working, this collaborative part. It's not working uh, for various reasons. The, the main reasons why it's working is we're getting more input because we're open and more people are benefiting and distributing enterprises from that so that's the kind of way we want to do it like really crazy stuff like stuff that's just inspiring like people need hope we need to inspire the whole world and and go out and make very bold call outs like like go to all the co uh oil companies of the world and say oh, okay here's we can here's how we can switch to hydrogen right now we know you guys right. are kind of you know, you, you do have a lot of vested interest and stuff like that. And it's not going to be easy, but we have to push those discussions. And I don't know how how far and how fast we'll, we'll do it, but we know that there's this incredible untapped potential of change and doing everything good, like, well, green chemistry, renewable energy, peaceful development, collaborative development of products, huge things, sound education. Like, can we go to, to now to schools and, and say, okay, in, in the new program of teaching, we're going to teach you about you too. We're going to teach you about psychology, about think, like critical thinking, which people say they do. They do teach. I think there's huge gaps in, in like w what's taught. So we can, for example, come into schools and say, okay, in order to get people fully empowered, we, we need to change the curriculum like this. Like, I hope I, I could have that kind of impact by showing that hey we're doing it here and we're getting people to do these amazing things because they're becoming integrated as humans uh and that's the key to our success the integration the that that aspect of collaboration integration systems thinking so for all the institutions out there including like the peace institutions right now we kind of like one of the outcomes of the war was that like nobody can really stop russia like there's not the institutions right. to to do it well, maybe we got to fix those institutions. What can we do there? Like, I'm starting to think like that. That's a project in itself. How do we how do we do that? Um, I think we can do that once we show open collaborative development, showing what's never been done before in terms of creation of progress. So that's the hope, and that's that's how I would like to approach. Um, simply because I believe there's a gap there, and <clears throat> there's a lot that can be done there. Does that answer the question, or? Perfectly. Yes, that, that's fantastic. Yeah. And we've touched on the future a bit as well and the excitement that the, that's there, but I want to readdress that. And as we head further into the year, is there anything that you're particularly excited about or looking forward to uh, for OSC this year? Yeah, well, it's absolutely that. Like what I just said about this grand vision, the grand vision starts yeah. with building a few houses, showing that we can execute them in, in the short times from five to, tw to five days to two weeks. If we can show that, if we can start our program, that's extremely exciting for me in a sense that, okay, now we're actually starting people on a very clear message. This is like, you can do this for a living. So that means we get more people doing open development out there or building the homes. So just getting the yeah. economic traction. I mean, that's, that's extremely exciting because all these years it's been about the vague notion that, oh yeah, these are good ideas and somehow it's gonna save the world. 
but that's not how it works. It just doesn't happen. It's a rigorous development process and very focused effort that that's very hard to sustain until people are doing it as a way of living. Um, so to get to that next stage of financial sustainability and growth, that would be incredibly exciting. And also to communicate, uh, part of that is communicating that message. So the kind of stuff like what we're trying to do here in terms of communicating or writing down any of these ideas, that's a part of it. I see um, writing a book kind of like the OSC manifesto or whatever, the OSC doctrine yeah. that says, hey, this is what's possible across the board to, to write a really powerful, inspirational document for what where we can go from here. I mean, everyone tries to do that. Um, and there's a lot of good work, but I, I think the combination that's unprecedented is just the injecting the open source, collaborative centric approach to that. Because when you kind of look at everything that's going on, uh, collaboration is limited. Like, like to give you an example, I mean, from the patent system to like HeroX you, or or X Prize. Have you heard of the X Prize? Moonshots, right? Competitions to fund moonshots, like um, creating a hundred mile per gallon car, or, or literally like uh, cleaning up all of the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, it's a X Prize is a known thing out there. But if you look at that, for example. So it's teams, once again, competing. You're not allowed to collaborate with other teams. Ah, uh, got it. You know, it's like when you think about it for a second, it's like, okay, are we really that wired that we need to compete? Like, realistically speaking, could we not do better if we say, okay, the new rules are we are all <laughs> collaborating um, to the best best design? Because we were trying to do, I mentioned the, the cordless drill challenge, incentive challenge on another platform yeah. called HeroX. And it blew me away when I looked at the rules. If you, if you collaborate with, with others, i.e., if you take their designs, you'll be disqualified. So the wow. rules are set everywhere, and it's subtle. It's everywhere. Rules everywhere. I have not seen any, like, the amount of collaborative stuff when I really look, because I really look for this. I am so amazed at what happens today. So if we can insert that element into anything that we do, that will be magic. Because you know, start looking for this now yourself. I mean, look at some project. Oh yeah, we've got this amazing development and uh, we're going to save the world. And then you, the next thing you look at is, well, they're proprietary. They do not collaborate. They do not share uh. their design with anybody else. Well, it's like, on one side you might say, well, that's obvious. They want to start their business. But on the other side, it's also obvious. Well, what could that do? You're not going to solve world problems if you don't don't collaborate or open up access to it. Um, so yeah, that part is extremely exciting as far as a new paradigm of collaborative development. Got it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, before we conclude the interview, I wanted to, wanted to ask, uh, is there anything that we haven't discussed or touched upon regarding OSC, your past, uh, your vision for the future that you'd like to talk about now before we close? Yeah, I mean, the only thing is, um, I think we got to, sh I, I would try to talk too much, but it's, this stuff is so powerful you just i think what our next step is to actually show a very clear example of possibility and that to me right now is the house the business is growing like crazy it's building homes better than than anybody else it may take some time but but we need to show one extremely clear extremely proactive open source centric collaboration centric effort that succeeds and inspires people so I can talk about that forever, but we just need to show this. Yeah. Because nobody well else said. is like, I don't, I don't think, I mean, who else is doing that? Like really pissed off enough to say, no, this is going to be absolutely collaborative and open source centric. Like that message you just don't hear out there. So, Got it. yeah. Sweet. Well, I think I'll end my uh, uh, audio recording here. Yeah, we should so we can wrap up. up. So thank you for thank you for taking the time to do this. This has been great. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to, to add in just off the interview record because I wasn't sure uh, how you know accurate it was. But when I was reading through the manifesto, I was really getting this sense of it brought me back to the the parallel society ideals, mm -hmm. you know, from, from the seventies and the eighties and and how they worked, you know, in the in communist countries and in Eastern Europe, and that is how it actually people were able to 
break away from the mainstream or the, the authoritarian and and people were drawn to creating your own thing and that is successful and it can really change the way that the entire structure works and institutions will change if people are you know are shown this so I think yeah. there's, there's so much yeah. hope for this I'm really excited for you yeah it's true I, you know my message is that I've seen come from a, a land that's super deprived you know like Poland and under communist regime to the kind of change that's happened to me I know that's possible like we can transform it just blows me away how one country is in absolute dumps and another country is absolutely prosperous like what's the difference right. it's like the operating systems the the paradigms the institutions I mean there's plenty of yeah. resources it's just like let's let's upgrade our our software in our head and think about prosperity for everybody yeah love that yeah. well, well thank you so much for doing this this has been fun <laughs> so what's our what's our next step uh, that, that's really up to up to you as well <laughs> I guess uh, it depends how you want what format you want this in because we could either write it as a you know question answer kind of format or I could write it as a long form piece integrating quotes paraphrases information from the wiki and website uh, is there a format that you prefer? It sounds like um, sounds like long form. Like, and what's the yeah? What's the greater framework for what we're gonna try to do? So, how many of these are we gonna try to get done per per time? What what do you think is we can do? So, we can do this one, and what what do yeah. you think about your future involvement? Well, for this one. I wanted to get more of a sense of like a broad brushstroke across, you know, background, vision, what the world's like now, what the world could be like, um, what needs to change. I think we've touched upon that in a very general sense. I think the next step would be going into specific projects, um, specific ideals, and really focusing on specifics instead of, instead of like a broad brush mm -hmm. along things, writing more into that lines and go really in depth. Um, but in terms of my personal contribution, um, well, I'll, I'll see how much time I put into to writing this long form piece, yeah. and if it's if it's balanceable with my work schedule. And if it is, that's great. Um, and if it isn't, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, but even if it isn't, we could do shorter form and go into more into depth about you know energy, about housing, and, and tackle these issues one at a time, and then wed those together into one central manifesto because I think that will really reach people who might who are new to this you know like for me when I was hearing about it uh, the when my dad was explaining that you could build a house with your friend in you know a matter of days to a week uh, for, for such a little amount of money once you're able to acquire land like that blew my mind and that had my mind racing with possibilities and I think that's how we reach people who had not heard of this before. Um, and one way to do that is through practical examples as like a teaser into the ideas. Because if someone hears, oh, this, you know, this movement could change your entire outlook on the world and the way that you think about collaboration and, and the resources that you have, that might be a bit much for people it's right off the bat. Whereas if someone says, hey, I could fix housing crisis or energy, that's you know, one issue instead of changing the entire way you look at the world that people could attach to and then lead themselves into this idea of, wow, I really need to readdress how I think about the world. Yeah. They're kind of using these specifics to get into the whole gist of what it is. So I think yeah. tackling those specifics would be a good place to start. That's good. We can get into, like, potentially even just in a working session. Yeah, you can ask questions or I can... Like, for example, what does it mean to solve housing? Well, I've got a document on wiki page on that, and it's like we can go into yeah. that. We can talk about, okay, what are some of the key things that we do know? Like, some, some things that most people probably will not know because they don't really look into this deep enough. But since we've been studying right. it a little bit, we can share some pretty interesting insights that are like, well, holy cow, oh, I didn't know that. And it just changes yeah. your perspective on, on how you approach it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be perfect. Yeah, I think that that's the way to do it. Is is tackle these issue by issue. I think housing is a good place to start as well. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that since that's that's relevant for us right now. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
well, when would you like to, to speak again? Is, is there a certain amount of time, or should I finish a long form piece first and then we go into it, or should uh, we just keep doing these and accumulate? Well, it sounds, it sounds like, um, I don't know, what do you think? It sounds like maybe getting the long form piece out maybe and then we can talk, or or yeah, should we, or, or do you think we should be continuing? I think long form piece first is, is a good step, because then you can see kind of my writing style, and if you like the, the way that I'm presenting information and in quotes, uh, we can just talk about that and kind of address the new housing issue plus the last long form piece in the yeah. same kind of yeah. space. So yeah. I, think, I think that's good, yeah. Okay. It might take me a couple of weeks, or probably like two weeks, I'd say, to, to finish it, if that's all right with you. If not, let me know. Let's do that, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So our next meeting would be basically let's, yeah, so maybe send me that and I can uh, look at that beforehand and we can meet and go forward. Great, and I'll keep you updated with, with Facebook messages too, so I'll be on Messenger. Yeah. Uh, I did want to ask you, um, you know, like, yeah. like I have the, the log on the wiki, can you start a log just to like put links to, can you get an account on the wiki? And then start a work log. Work log is just you put put in links to what you're doing. Like for example, if you're working on this document, put a link there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I'll send you, I'll send I can upload the document up there. Yeah. All you need to do is like, because you can edit the wiki and you can just uh, type in a, or just copy and paste the URL and it'll be the link for the. So we can have it like so I don't have to like look through my inbox. I keep everything. Basically, for this global collaboration part, we do everything on the wiki. Like I can find anybody's work there. So. Awesome. It'll be convenient. Yeah, so I'll request a count up there, right? Yep. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so I'll put my work on, on the wiki then. Okay. Yeah, sweet. So sweet. So let's, you know, let's, let's wait till we do this, maybe a couple of weeks, and then uh, let's meet again. Great. Well, it's been okay. a pleasure. Thank you okay. for taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks for spending the time. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.